you. Well, <laughs> Sherry, we're not blessed to have the life he does where he, he, he said he forgot he was usually has Fridays to get ready for the weekends. So. <laughs> oh, I see. That's fine. That's a must be, it must be nice. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, because we're, we've lost a lot of precious time, but we'll, I just want this to be a top quality experience because uh -huh. um, you've done such a fantastic job. Um, so I'm just going to kind of stop for a second and then start over so we can cut and <laughs> paste to make this look yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure today to introduce you to Sherry Wilson. She was the first female firefighter in the Dallas Fire Department and prior to retirement on her days off started a consulting business and she is now president of emergency management resources and does all kinds of awesome training around the world. Uh, but our purpose in our interview today is to uh, let us uh, learn from her experience in writing this book and her vision about uh, the importance of sharing your stories uh, in written form to preserve America's fire service history. Uh, Sherry, your, your book, Faith by Fire, uh, in it you share how you became uh, focused on being a firefighter. And uh, could you just share some of the key factors that led to your decision to be a firefighter and uh, what prompted you to seek to be the first female firefighter in Dallas? Well, interesting enough, I really did not want to be a fire or didn't know I wanted to be a firefighter. I wanted to be a paramedic. I wanted to, you know, help people. And uh, what happened was as a child at a very young age, I witnessed an accident where no one was doing anything. And I, it struck me that all these adults were standing around and not taking any kind of action. And I just thought something was wrong with that. And uh, I, I guess out of that, I grew this need to to be somebody that could do that. I was very interested in all those courses and health and first aid and, and all. And I was just compelled to, to live my life that way. I mean, I feel like, you know how a lot of people aren't sure what their purpose is. I feel like that I've lived my purpose. And so, yeah, so, you know, I wanted to be a paramedic and they said, well, you gotta be a firefighter first. And I went, okay. And I, you know, I was very physical. I was an athlete. Uh, I didn't have, I mean, I had to work uh, to build up my upper body strength, but it wasn't like, I mean, just somehow down deep in my bones, I just knew that this is what I was supposed to do without a shadow of a doubt. So there you have it. Very good. Well, uh, you described some of the challenges that you faced as being the, uh, a not only a female fighter, but just a rookie in the fire department and uh, how your faith took you to success. Uh, what's a prime example of one of those experiences? Well, it's funny because I've lived both sides of this now that I'm older, but I remember hearing men say, you don't belong here. And I remember thinking, oh my God, they're so old in their thinking. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm on the other side of that because I'm like, oh, my God, what are these kids thinking? But but inside of that, there was this, oh, yes, I can. And, and you know, I had a mother that told me you can do anything in life that you want to do as long as it's honorable to God. And I felt helping people was an honorable thing. And I just remember, you know, back in the day, I was referred to as a bra burner or something like that. And, and I mean, I, I was given so many names and labels that assumed I was a certain way. And really, it was just I had this heart and this passion to help people. And um, so um, that's you know, what was going on back then. And, and as a result of all of that, I had to overcome a lot of very difficult situations, but somehow deep inside, it was worth it. It was, it was all part of the story. And I really believe in the, the subtitle of my book is the first ingredient of a miracle is the impossible situation. 
And I've just witnessed impossible situations over and over and over. And inside of that, I've seen a lot of miracles too. And I'm just a believer to the point that when I see something happening that is impossible, let's take COVID, for example, I start thinking, okay, where's the miracle inside of all this? Because it's got to be coming, right? It's got to be coming because <laughs> we're having this impossible situation. And, and that takes a lot of faith and belief that, that God is who he says he is and he's going to do what he says he can do. So anyhow, that, uh, that's where I'm at with that. <laughs> okay. But there's not a, not a specific incident you would want to share? Oh, yeah. There are a lot of specific incidences, um, but my signature story in the book is Gutted Up Girl. And as a matter of fact, Gutted Up Girl is the name of the screenplay that I pitched. I was pitching it yesterday to a producer, but um, Gutted Up Girl, I, I worked at Station 3. And Station 3, I felt like I had more brothers, daddies, uncles, grandpas than a woman could ever want. But when I got my, my 10 shifts in, I had to start swinging. So swinging meant when another station had somebody off sick or on vacation, they would balance the manpower. And I swung to this one station and uh, they were nice to me. I mean, they were nice to me. They were like, here's where you eat, this is where we sleep, blah, 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 put your gear here. I was all excited. I was gonna get to ride the tailboard and uh, it wasn't really the tailboard, you know, they did away with that um, a long time ago, but everything was great right up until we had a fire. And I got to the fire and I knelt down in front of the fire and I had already stretched out my hose and me and the lieutenant were about to go in and there's this thing that firefighters do and we we adjust our mask and we nod our heads in agreement. And then we head into this fire. And inside the fire, I felt like I had been tackled. And the thing that was interesting is that it's not unusual for us to trip over hoses or furniture or whatever, and you just kind of get up and you shake it off. Well, I couldn't get up. Somebody was laying over the back of me. Mm. And it was like this epiphany, like, what is going on here? And then I, then I heard it. And what I heard was at the base of my tank, while they held me down, I had had my mask disconnected. And of course, I, you know, drew a, a tiny breath and I sucked in for more air and that mask just vacuumed to my face and I couldn't get any air. And I ripped off my mask and I handed off my nozzle in defeat, which is breaking the cardinal rule of firefighting. You never give away your nozzle. But I was now inhaling this thick black smoke from a foam mattress. And that is just black syrupy type smoke. And after I handed off the nozzle, I ran to the door and just outside the door, I am on my knees and I'm coughing and I'm hacking up this black muck from my lungs. And the fire was a small one. It wasn't a big deal to put out. And the next thing I know, I'm just, I've got the, you know, my eyes are covered with all this stuff and I can barely see but I heard somebody, they stepped over me and they said, gut it up, girl. And I remember thinking, what do I, what do, what do I need to gut up? And uh, I heard cursing. I heard people throwing their helmets at the fire engine saying women don't belong. And it was all I could do to crawl back up on that engine and go back to that fire station. And it, it wasn't unusual for me to go second. So all the guys hit the shower and then I hit the shower. And I just remember going into that shower and that hot steamy water was just 
loosening everything up. And I just remember turning, crawling into a ball and just crying. And then I got angry. And my anger had to do with, oh, no, you're not going to make me quit. You see what I'm saying? It was like, oh, no, I am not going to let them win. And I stayed that entire shift. And I couldn't even stay in the bedroom because I was hacking and coughing so bad. I ended up with pneumonia for a couple of weeks and reported off sick. And I never told anybody wow. because I thought I would never be able to walk in another fire station if I did. And I just kind of tucked that down and, and it took quite a bit of counseling and some leadership training to where I got to a point where I had to create a possibility. You know, things happen to us and we give them this horrible meaning. And I had to recreate the meaning. And my meaning for Gutted Up Girl was that I was, you know, threatened, but it became, this is gonna be my miracle. I don't know how, I don't know when, but it's gonna be my miracle. Well, I now have the book and I now have the screenplay. And I really believe with all my heart that I'm going to get to see it and witness it on, on the silver screen. But why does that story need to, need to be told? Because it's a negative story, but it's an overcoming story that you can do anything you want to do as long as you think about what you're thinking about and you don't give it this horrible meaning, but you give it the meaning that it's the first ingredient of your miracle. And it, it, that is that impossible situation. So I began to look for the miracle in my life. And one of the miracles was retirement. One of the miracles was my business and, and what I'm doing there. And all the things that I've learned in the fire department, situational awareness and safety, if you think about it, I've responded to every kind of safety incident you can imagine. I mean, machine guarding, fires, you know, I have stories to tell. And compelling stories are compelling learning for people. You know what I'm saying? So I come from safety with a different background because I've been there, done that, seen it and went, oh my God, what are people thinking? And so now I teach it from, from that that point of view and I just feel like I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing I'm doing it exactly when I'm supposed to be doing it and I sleep good every night because I just know that I've lived my purpose and I'm not finished fantastic Sherry I just love to hear your story because I think it's so easy for all of us no matter male female whatever race we are whatever to let things get us down and I think the way you've helped us to uh, visualize through your book that it's up to you how you take it and dwell on positives or dwell on negatives and search for search for the positives I just really love that uh, I want to ask a, a, a related question you've you shared how this led to your book and so forth mm -hmm. one of the judges in our group uh, reviewing the books made the comment about your book that this is a must read for any fire service manager for every fire service manager mm -hmm. and uh, from what what do you think is the must must read the key lesson uh, for managers if you could uh, tutor them a little bit here well you know I think everybody needs some leadership training and leadership training takes you from who you are and who your past is based on how mama did your boss did it blah 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 and it takes you to a new level of integrity so that you really analyze yourself and there's a lot of things that were allowed to happen you know when i walked in the station my captain was the one that humped my leg right and i could have gotten mad but what i did was i thought about it and I wanted to be a good team player. So I waited until it was a few shifts in and I had had time to think. And I just approached him and I said, you know, I know it was funny and it's okay. I'm not angry. I said, however, I said, I just don't feel like I'm a respected part of the team 
when everybody is humping my leg. And then I just let it drop. And he goes, they are humping your leg? And I said, well, you did it. So it's okay, right? And see, I didn't get angry. I stayed neutral. I stayed curious. I stayed respectful. And he said, I'll handle it. And so I think every person needs a chance. I know I've made mistakes and I needed chances. And my captain made a mistake and he needed a chance. And basically and fundamentally, he was a great guy. He really was. He taught me things that a lot of people didn't teach me, you know, that really prepared me for when I moved on to other stations. And so while, I mean, you have to be forgiving to be a leader, uh, but you also have to have a higher level of integrity and what you believe and what you speak and how you behave has everything to do with that. And I think leaders need to be an example. And they don't need to have this holier than thou. I mean, yes, you can laugh off a few things. But what he did for me that night was he stood up in front of the men in the kitchen during dinner and said on day one, we humped her leg. And it was funny. And they all laughed. And I thought, oh, Lord, where is this headed? But then the words that came out of his mouth was now she is part of our team and we're gonna treat her like a team member and no one will be humping her leg anymore. And see, leadership has to communicate the rules and they have to enforce the rules. And I let him say face is basically what happened. Yeah. And, and I think that there has to be forgiveness. You know what I'm saying? You just have yeah. to be a forgiving person because if you spend your whole life trying to figure out why you're going to be angry, you know, life and death really is in the power of your words. And as you think, so are you. Mm -hmm. And I just thought my purpose was, wasn't to demand my rights or to force and control them. My purpose was to be a rescuer, uh -huh. no matter, no matter what. And so a lot of people don't think things through. There's, you know, um, the word offense to me is offensive because there's no love inside of being offended and there's no leadership in that either. And I think a leader has to tame their highly self-flattering view of themselves. And we need to approach people in a team dynamics, you know, clear responsibility, clear roles, mutual respect, constructive intervention. And that, that captain saved my bacon one day. I'll never forget it. And we pulled up, I stretched out my hose, and I was just about to open my nozzle on a lead smelter. And you know what would have happened. It would have spit fire back at me and it boiled me alive. But Cap knowing a young rookie said, Sherry, do not put that water on that smelter, put it on the pallets, just put out the pallets around. And I said, okay. And then after the fire, I asked him why. And he goes, it would have boiled you alive, girl. And I was like, you know, there's something about contributing to people in such a way, even when they're not pretty, that gives them permission to contribute back to you. And I ended up loving that man and still to this day, he's written into the movie, but I didn't use his name. I used a different name for him uh, out of respect because he'd made a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, but anyhow, um, people are resistant to change. And if you're resistant to change, that's something that you need to have a conversation with yourself about. You know, science says we have 60,000 conversations with ourselves every day. Now, somebody listening to this just said, no, I don't. Well, you just had one, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so if you know you're having these conversations, why not monitor those conversations? Why not think about it and say, is that really who I am? Is that really who I want to be? Is that really the way I want to come across? And, um, you know, I, I listened to Prince Henry uh, Harry, Prince Harry, today on the news, and he was talking about all this upset he is with his family, and I'm like, 
oh my gosh, if he really spent time thinking about the negativity that he's driving in, in the wedges that he's driving in his family, with these are people he loves. And he's not thinking about it. He's letting these stories spin out of control. And, and while, yes, there may be some adjustments that need to be made, we can, we can propel ourselves forward negatively or we can propel ourselves forward positively. And I think I was fortunate enough and I had enough faith in me and belief in God. I mean, I was always in a conversation with God. God, did you see that? You know what I'm saying? What what is going on here? And and having had that conversation with him and having known that, you know, all things are possible, even for a woman to become a firefighter in the 70s. Um, I just really believe my faith. And I think a lot of people don't understand how faith is where it, I mean, it's such a positive way to live. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I have yeah. hope that other people don't have uh, because I have faith in God. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but I'll shut up now. Well, one, one last question. Uh, I, I think one of the key focuses of the Fire Heritage Center is making sure that we preserve the perishable in terms of the fire service history. Is there something about the history of women uh, coming into the fire service, maybe you've had interaction with other women in the fire service, but is there something about the history of women coming into the fire service that you would hope you've preserved? Well, I think the fire department is a much kinder, gentler group of people today. You know, agitation still shows up, but it's a little bit more playful and they, they back down a lot quicker. I, I'm excited to see, there was more than a hundred women in our department after I left. I was by myself for a couple of years and some of them are running it. You know, my friend, Trixie Lorkey, battalion chief uh, in district eight, she's about to retire. And, and I so admire her ability to lead those men in a positive, thoughtful and compassionate way. And I just, I think women have been good for the, the fire service in a, more ways than one. And don't ever let, don't in, let anybody tell you you can't do something because here's the thing, I've seen it from the inside. It takes a team. You know, they go, oh, well, I want somebody that can pull me out. Well, I'm gonna tell you, it takes a team. And there are people that are good at some things and people that are not so good at some things. But as a team, when we come together, we can get the job done. And I loved that about the fire department, the team dynamics that we had and how, you know, even if we didn't like one another, when the bell hit, all of that stopped and we were working together to make a difference in somebody's life. And there is no way that you can walk away from an incident like, like that and not appreciate one another for the role that they played. You know, I remember my, I'm very double jointed and there was a cat stuck in an engine and nobody could get this cat out, but I'm so double jointed and can get my hand so small, I was able to reach in and get the cat. out. And I know that's a stupid story, but we all have our place. Mm -hmm. And my place was, was paramedic. Um, my place was driver engineer. Um, my place was incident command technician. And one of my favorite places that I worked was um, this, the fire department PIO. And, you know, back in those days, we didn't acknowledge one another like we do today. And I was all about making sure that firemen got acknowledged and submitted people for awards and, and submitted the department for awards. And I just love that because, you know, 99.9% .9 of firefighters are good, fundamental, God-believing people. And there's a few bad apples that we have, we have worked together to weed them out because they didn't belong. 
but m basically and fundamentally, fundamentally firefighters and the fire service and the paramedic service for that matter is a powerful, uh, has a powerful effect and a positive effect on lives in America. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of having been a part of that. And it even goes back to my grandpa. He was a load and go mortician. And he responded to that incident where I saw nobody doing anything. And that stuck with me. He was my first hero. And I don't want any little girls rolling down their lip and pouting like I did because nobody did anything. I want to go in there and give it my all. Mm -hmm. And I think most firefighters do. Thank you, Sherry. Awesome story. And I'm glad that you uh, let God guide you to do these things. Um, one last quick thought, because I do need to close uh, here. But uh, a lot of people are thinking about writing their story, but they just can't get there and do it. Do you have any any quick points you would say to somebody that's thinking about helping to preserve their story in the fire service? Well, I used to journal um, back in the day. I still have all my journals. As a matter of fact, I've only written 60,000 out of 200,000 words. So who knows, <laughs> there could be another book coming. But, um, you know, now with the phone, you can step aside and you can voice your message and there's apps now you just speak what happened and it'll put it into print for you and you show it up and you just start saving all that and then you take your journals and that's what I did put my journals together Very and it, it helped me with accuracy and things like that so if you feel compelled to tell your story start documenting your story because you will lose things I'm going to tell you, there's there's some things that I remember a certain way, and I go back and I look in the journal, and I go, oh, it wasn't that way, and and that's just the science of the brain. The brain has a, a little bit of uh, it's a little bit of a liar to you because it'll fill in gaps of stuff that you forgot. It's called <laughs> I can't even remember the word for it, but yeah, the journal saved me on that and helped me help me with the story. Now some of the stories are fluffed and they're created. Um, so that there's a red line through it. And what I mean by the book, the, there's a thread that goes throughout the whole book. And I kind of had to build that in, but I'm not going to tell them what it is. They have to go find it. There's actually about five of those. And so um, that ties all the stories together. And some of that is made up, but the stories are the stories. Sherry, we'll have your book in the National Fire Heritage uh, Archive Library. Uh -huh. If someone wants to buy a copy, uh, how, where do they go? All right. You can go to Amazon. The book is available on Amazon. Please um, um, fill out a, an evaluation on it after you read it. That would be great. That would be helpful. And hopefully you'll see it on the screen one day. Very good. Very good. Thanks again, Sherry. And congratulations on an awesome career. All right. And an awesome book. All right. Thank you. Now that we're officially off, I've got to run, take care of David. Okay. <laughs> Tell him I said hi. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. I just, hello? Hello, hello? Ah, oh, fuck. All right.
Alright, so let's do this. Let's end.